the AJ Brown Show, where we talk about all things investing, options trading, and the like. Now here's your host, AJ, whose primary mission in life is to help you become a better investor. And welcome back, everyone, to the AJ Brown Show. My name is Cyprian Francis. And with me, as always, the main man of the hour, AJ Brown. Good morning, AJ. Hey, Sip. How you doing, man? Doing good. Uh, another exciting week here for us. Today is April 1st, April Fools. I'm not sure if you've got any, if you were fooled yet this morning, but I certainly was. Um, uh, but we It's Nick's birthday. Oh, on a Friday? That's exciting. You must have a lot planned. On an April Fool's day every year oh so you could kind of you know mess with her with that one (laughs) (laughs) i think she's been messed with her whole life on that one uh but you know the first of the month i think the the first quarter just ended um that means a lot of things are going to be happening over the next couple of days couple of weeks as people recalibrate we had big earning or uh big employment news today Let's get straight into it. What are your thoughts initially? Do we do we want to go over some of the economic news from last week? Do we want to talk about what happened today? What's on your mind? Well, okay, so let's talk about the economic news from today. So the employment situation was just released a couple of hours ago, and it's really not uh, too different than what we expected. The big news on the employment situation is that um, we've got um, – Last month, maybe it was a, a, a fluke or something, but last month we didn't see our average hourly earnings going up. So we were thinking, okay, yes, uh, people are spending a lot of money, but they're not making more money. And so things are starting to, to taper. This month, we actually saw the average hourly earnings go up uh, almost a half a percent. So a lot of people are looking at that number right there. I like to look at this participation rate number. Uh, It's been slowly, you know, ticking up every month, which is actually a good thing because a lot of folks had taken themselves outside of the job market. And so they're slowly coming back in. If this number comes on, you know, at some point in the next year or two, around 68%, that's going to be significant. Um, Otherwise, it's not that uh, important to me. Uh, you know, they revised up last month. Last month, they had really uh, beat expectation with the number of jobs created. Well, they went back and recounted and they got even more. This month, they're saying that they missed expectations by about the same month amount that they got last month. So it kind of comes out in the wash. But really, the more interesting thing for me with respect to economic news is the uh, personal income and outlays report. The personal income and outlays report, a lot of people don't pay as much attention to this as they should. This is, and I pulled it up right at the government website. Um, This is what the Fed uses often as their main indicator of what's going on, especially this uh, number right here, this personal consumption and expenditures number. They've got it for the month and they've got it for the year. This is right off of the uh, Bureau of Economic Analysis website. And they actually, the Fed pays a lot of attention to this personal consumer expenditures, excluding food and energy, because that's quite volatile. But that number for the year, 5.4%, what this is, is how much people are spending. Spending on stuff that um, uh, is not food and energy, which can be quite volatile. And people are spending a lot, 5.4%. You can see that that number it has been going up. So year over year, 5.4%. And it looks like month over month, it's a little bit down, but year over year, my gosh. So we're spending a lot on like cars. This is not, you know, non-disposable things, cars, dishwashers, new things like that. And that's causing a a lot of the whole um, inflation thing. And so the Fed, I, I have a feeling, you know, we've been hinting from Jerome Powell that he's ready to do half point hikes in the interest rate. And we talked about a couple of weeks ago about their um, quantitative easing program, and they're ready to start unwinding that. And I have a feeling if this number doesn't flatten out soon, 
uh, we're going to see some real tight clamps on our inflation by the Fed every time they meet. I wouldn't be surprised if next time they meet, a half point doesn't come our way. So would we want to start to see this number go in the opposite direction, right? So yeah. 5.4, maybe to 5.2 or 5, 4.9. I mean, to be honest, the Fed would like to see this around between two and three. And that's consistently year over year is kind of the baseline. Yeah, that that's where the Fed would. The Fed believes that the United States is a uh, economy that can grow about two to three percent a year. And so having people spending about uh, around that two to three number, uh, that's that's where they'd like to see it. They think that the the economy is overheating right now, and a, as it, it it is, there's been a lot of money both monetarily and fiscally injected into the economy over the last couple of years. And so I think there's going to be some reckoning going on here. But you know, I, I'm on the option side of things, so I can make money when the market goes up, down, or sideways. So I'm ready for these 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 balloons to bust. Exactly. And if they are a uh, half point hikes, that does increase the overall volatility, which helps some of the option strategies that we go over. Um, Absolutely. I'm curious to see uh, where we are, um, you know, maybe on the S&P 500 with this week's news. Right. And so. OK. I, yeah. Yeah. Go I'm, ahead. I, I, I'm, I, I, I'm excited about this because. So a lot of people have been, you know, we do this retracement analysis where we look at the last time we moved and we compare it to this time it moves and all of that good stuff. We've talked about that week in and week out. So let's take a look at some of the numbers we've been looking at. So first of all, in theory, if we're still in the downtrend, then we would be, whenever we move against the downtrend, we would be doing a contraction phase a range contraction phase, basically testing that downtrend. And if we were testing up, I just want to give people kind of the, the gauges that we're using. If it only pulled back a little before going down again, we would consider that weak, a weak downtrend. I'm just going to put the letters DT here. If it pulls back about halfway, we would consider that a nice strong hint at a downtrend, especially if then it continued to move down and move down with some vigor. So moving to about here, and that's supposed to be the letter G. Don't worry about that. Um, if it goes too far, again, we consider that a weak downtrend. And if it goes over 100%, meaning retraces past the high close of the previous reversal, well, then we're going to call that a weak uptrend. And then if it really goes past, and we have this mark here that we used 123.6% past, we start calling that a strong uptrend. So we actually have to come to the conclusion that we are no longer downtrending, that indeed instead we're uptrending. So look at what happened here. And it looks like we're about to get a confirmation down here. So I use this three and five day exponential moving average to get a confirmation around, you know, whenever we get a crossing, that's a confirmation that you indeed have seen the top. And so this was our top right here. Um, you can see over here, we have to let a few days go by because sometimes we get these tests and they don't actually do the crossings like we see here. Like these little guys are tests. This might just be a test. So we're going to let it a couple days go by because the S&P could totally fake us out like it did over here and go for yet another high. But right now we've moved, right? We were watching this 4,600 number. We wound up closing above that 4,600. We actually are now thinking that we should be changing our thoughts and considering this now, instead of a downtrend anymore, we're beginning a weak uptrend. And we'll let this thing pull back and we'll see if this was actually a top being found. We'll see if this is a real crossing in the next couple of days. Then we're going to be watching the pullback to see how far we pull back and then the move up. 
this could be a new uptrend that we need to be following. We were doubting it for weeks, but the S&P trudged higher before it started to reverse. So we're in this weak uptrend, at least according to this analysis method. And so I'm starting to you know, close down my uh, positions that would profit if the market was going down. Um, I'm starting to close them down. I'm not ready to open positions in the upward direction. And as far as my premium selling positions, the sideways positions, those just keep going on like clockwork. Yeah, and that's uh, we'll go through a few examples here in a second. For anybody that's watching for the first time, feel free to hit that follow or that subscribe button. We do take live questions. So if there is a stock or a ticker that you're interested in, go ahead and drop it into the chat. And I feel like, uh, you know, in terms of the overall geopolitical scene, things are starting to ease up a bit. I think there's some talks taking place. Energies are starting to come down a bit. So, you know, that mixed in with the interest rate stuff and, and a new quarter um, really have a lot to look forward in the next, you know, two weeks, I would say. I can tell when things are starting to become normalized, like what's happening in the Ukraine. It, of course, it's not normalized for the, the p folks who live there. But for us, in the you know, we have these attention spans that go very quickly. And so I can tell it's normalized when the main headline, and I we've got this cool backdrop here, when the main headline of the week is not what's happening in the Ukraine, but rather when one actor clocks another comedian on the stage of the Oscars, right? That's right. And it, it, was, it was funny. I was watching the trends this week, and... We had all this Ukraine, Russia, Putin, and then one Will moment Smith. at one moment at the Oscars just <laughs> trumps it all for the for the remainder of the week, which is kind of why we've chosen the Oscars background for today. Because AJ, yeah. I think you know your performance week in and week out deserves an Oscar <laughs> in itself. Thank you, thank you. I'd like to thank uh, everybody. Uh, we actually have a question that just came in, and I think it fits in line with some of the what we were just talking about, and that's XLF. I believe that's the that's energy silver ETF. E yeah. Is so, that the energy or is that silver? Let's take a look. Um, oh, that's financial fine. ETF. That's like our Bank of America, our Goldman Sachs, all wrapped up into an ETF like that. So what's the question? Uh, just your thoughts on it, basically. Oh, okay. Well, let's go back a little bit. Let's take a look at the silver. Here. I mean, the uh, uh, financial. This is a, a, a symbol to me that we should be selling premium on. Now, uh, the premium selling strategy that I like so much and a trend following strategy, uh, these two strategies play really well together. So if you're a trend trader, um, you might consider also premium selling because the beautiful part about it is if you do some trend trading with options, so you're using uh, perhaps options trading at parity as your substitute for the stock, when that trend starts to flatten out, you could easily adjust that position into a premium selling position. And for premium selling positions, if that premium selling position stops going sideways and starts trending, you can easily adjust that position into a trend following position or a trend trading position. So I like if you're going to combine two different types of trading, I would combine premium selling with trend trading. So in the case here, I would continue premium selling. So premiums, th this this candidate right here is topping out. So depending on whether or not your initial position is long or short, you'd probably be taking some sort of action here, right? You'd be either um, selling premium and buying some protective options, or you'd probably be rolling your protective options out for a profit. So the XLF is a great position. And if you haven't gotten into the XL XLF yet, this would be a great time if you were thinking about getting into it to go ahead and short uh, either some short sum of the ETF itself or buy some substitute put options. So when I say substitute put options, I think for these type of strategies, the best thing to do would be to um, buy some deep in the money options. The deep in the money options become trading at parity. That means they move dollar for dollar with the stock. And so 
use a little bit of leverage. Either way, whether you short the stock or buy some deep in the money put options, um, I think that you can't go wrong here. And if you're already in the trade, just keep going, right? Uh, premium trades allow you to collect premiums every time options expire. Yeah, and that, that price point there isn't too bad. And I would assume there's a decent amount of liquidity because of the nature of the asset. Let's take a quick look at that. Because um, if I come over here and take a look, the let's take a look at uh, a substitute option. So a substitute option, we probably, Probably because we know we can sell up to eight months or more of premiums, um, we probably want to go at least eight months out. So it's the beginning of April, beginning of May, June, July, August, September, October, November, December. So I don't see any December options, but I definitely see the leap available. And leaps typically have a lot of liquidity. So I would actually choose an option. Um, you're right. There is a, a heck ton of liquidity. I would choose an option uh, that has less than 5% extrinsic value. So uh, maybe something, and I'm doing this math in my head, but uh, maybe we're talking about something like this $25. Uh, if you're put, then we'd have to go in the other direction. Uh, the puts, let's see, do, 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 uh, maybe, yeah. Maybe this $50 put, uh, if you're going to substitute that for shorting the stock, it's trading somewhere between $11.75 and $11.90. So you buy some of those, and that will, in effect, every time the underlying symbol goes down a dollar, this put will go up a dollar, basically. That's how we do it, by minimizing the extrinsic or premium component and maximizing the intrinsic. This intrinsic is the dollar for dollar connection to the stock. So yeah, I think that there's something to be said there. Yeah, totally. Awesome. Appreciate the question, Timothy. Uh, what we're going to do next is run through AJ's ticker of the week. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. We might need to come up with the name of that. But before we do that, let's just remind everybody that uh, AJ does a daily workshop where he breaks down the strategies, tells you a little bit more about uh, the, the benefits of trading options, selling premium. I'm going to go ahead and drop a link in the chat. Um, and we're also going to play our little teaser for that webinar. And then we'll jump into some more of these tickers. And as always, if you have something on your mind, drop it in the chat and we'll try and get through it. I get it. You're afraid of trading in the markets. Guess what? I've got your answer. I've got four strategies I'm going to give you along with the tools to make it super easy. I'm going right home, giving you the webinar. I need you to sign up below and meet me in a few minutes. All right. And so our first ticker of the week and as we were just talking about at the beginning of the, before the show started is of the unicorn turned, you know, IPO success now showtime series, um, Uber. Yeah. Uh, we're going to be fe featuring Uber this week. And so if we take a look back at Uber, I'm watching that show, by the way, it's a very interesting show. At this, probably know the the Uber has kind of transformed itself into more of a, a a regular company instead of a blood eating mono e mono type company that's run by like an author authoritarian. Um, but um, the scoop is with Uber is we identified that. A downtrend started about October 15th. Not about. That's where we identified the day, the beginning of the downtrend. And so we've been following this downtrend. In fact, if you've uh, traded on this day, uh, October 15th, if you would have gotten yourself one of those back month put options, uh, as of now, I mean, we're talking about over 100% return on investment on that trend trade. Now, I don't know if you'd actually follow the signal that early. I think that uh, from our point of view, we probably wouldn't have gotten into with our signals. I'm looking at some of our signals. 
probably around October 27th. But still, the gains from October 27th to even today with uh, our latest kind of push up uh, would have been really nice. Uh, but I want to zoom into like the most recent three months. All right. So very similar to the S&P 500, we're watching to see what Uber does next. You know, I use this three and five day exponential moving average crossing to kind of confirm when a top has been found. And so I'm waiting to see if we get this crossing here to see if this most recent top right here was the top of the latest move. If so, we've moved into that area again that I call the weak downtrend area. It kind of overshot where we would have thought a pullback for a strong downtrend should have been, but got into this weak area before heading down. That doesn't mean we are ready to sell those positions, those back month puts, but it could also be a great opportunity now for us to dollar cost average, right? And we're, we want, again, we want to wait a little bit, see that confirmation, make sure that confirmation isn't just a little like test, but it's a real confirmation. And then we could, for instance, add some more to our portfolio. Um, the reason why I wanted to feature Uber is a lot of folks have been asking me when the underlying symbol has a bit of a trend to it. So this Uber has a bit of a downtrend to it. Uh, can we still sell premium? Absolutely. Um, every time you have a moment where Uber goes against the main trade. So the main trade here would be a downtrending trade, either a shorted stock or a substitute back month deep in the money put option. Every time Uber pulls back, that's an opportunity to sell premium. Now, about the amounts you're going to make. So think about it. If we've got a sideways channeling symbol, the original trade, whether it be going long or going short, won't really appreciate by the end. So you don't make much money on the back end by getting out of the original trade. However, optimized is the premium trade. So every cycle, every time, whether you're using weekly options or monthly options, you get a pretty big payday. When you start to introduce a little bit of a trend, so in this case, we're talking about a little bit of a trend on Uber, if you are in a shorted position, that back month position, when all is said and done, will be worth more. It will appreciate that whole way. And so because you can't get something for nothing, when you do sell premium on something that's trending, it turns out the monthly and weekly premiums are going to be a little bit less or even a lot less but don't forget you're making money on the back end. So either you've got something that's sideways where you don't really make money on the back end, but your premiums are, are, are big, or you're making money on the back end, but then you're also making small amounts every time that underlying symbol goes against you. And the reason why I'm featuring Uber is because I think that we can do one of these trades. In fact, I'm pretty sure we can continue with one of these trades where we either uh, continue if we've already been in some sort of shorted position or option substitute for that shorted position. We could totally, every time this Uber goes against you, sell a little bit of premium and make a little bit of extra scratch. Every time you make a little bit of extra profit uh, on these retracements, it lowers your cost basis or in the case of a shorted option, kind of raises where your break-even price is and creates a more delta when you finally get out of that back-end position. So it never hurts to sell premium. Just don't expect the same sort of numbers you would expect on a sideways. Yeah, and Uber's uh, big move last year, I believe, was uh, the purchase of Postmates, right? So, yeah. so they really dove into the delivery space um, to layer in on top of the, you know, peer to peer ride sharing concept. Um, and, you know, they seem to be starting to make money, at least on the fundamental side. So uh, it does look like a great setup from the technical perspective. 
Yeah, we don't want to jump into any more uh, positions yet. I want to wait for that confirmation that I found a top. And I'd like to make sure that that top basically stalls here in this kind of downtrend area. Still within my, you can see my white line, which is my descending line of resistance. I want to make sure it kind of stays tame. And, and so let's not shoot until we see the whites of their eyes, but it's setting up to be a real nice. I mean, it's been a real nice trade, like I said, since October 15th, but it looks like it's going to continue to be such. Yeah. A hot name in, you know, the industry for sure. All right, let's keep rocking and rolling with some more questions. The next question comes from Jane in Oregon. I believe Eugene, Oregon, uh, asking about a ticker that we've gone over a few times already ruth steakhouse oh yeah some neat things have happened with ruth let's zoom in a little bit to the most recent move so this is one of those cases and i think that's the theme of the day you know the market has been uh quite interesting over the last uh weeks and months so ruth we were selling our premium and this, you might have uh, paid attention or picked up on me saying this a little bit earlier in the show. If you are in a symbol that you're buying and selling premium on, and that symbol starts trend following, like Ruth did, it's easy to modify. And what we usually use is we use our, our Fibonacci price retracement lines, not really buying into the woo-woo and magic that can be around the Fibonacci price retrace line. You know, there's books out there that kind of associate the Fibonacci series with magic, and that's why the market is magical. I don't really buy into that. I use it more like a ruler, right? And I like to pay attention to these different retracements, like, like how far out of where I believe support and resistance is, are we? Right? And so... I have found that when you go two lines out, that the likelihood that you're going to retrace back into the sideways channel drops off exponentially. And so when you see that happen with a symbol that you're in, if it depends on the direction if you're in. If you're in a long position, guess what? You do nothing. You don't sell premium. You don't buy protection. In fact, you change your gear. And as a good trend trader, you wait for the trend to end, and then you take your profits. So in this case, letting Ruth uh, go all the way up to about $23, even if you didn't uh, take advantage of this next move, if you got out here, that would have been a nice ending to the premium selling trade that you did for months earlier, because that would be just a capper of some nice gains on the original position. So you let that original position appreciate rather than continuing to sell premium against it. What we're doing now, Jane, is we're waiting to see what happened next. In other words, a lot of times symbols that go sideways, they like to have these moments where they get either excited or even deflate a little bit, but then they just start going sideways again. My usual suggestion in that case is wait till, you know, take advantage of whatever profits you can. If you are in a short position against Ruth, well, then you want to go ahead and stop yourself out um, and take whatever gains you made on the premium selling and just wait. Be patient. We want to see if this establishes into a new sideways channel. You could start paper trading this, Jane, but I wouldn't trade this uh, with real money until I have at least a couple of tests of a new level of resistance and at least a couple tests of a new level of support to tell me that, hey, I'm just going to recalibrate my whole premium selling strategy on this new angle. Yeah, and, and this is setting up for your staple premium selling strategy at that lovely $20 stock price that really gives yeah. you flexibility. Yeah, yeah. Um, this happens often. When we're selling premium, there's a step function increase or decrease in the channel. We ride that trend. Then we step out of the trade for at least a cycle or two till we establish that the new sideways channel, the new uh, move is solid, right? There's no reason to like 
jump into these very risky trades where the channel hasn't been established yet. I mean, that kind of uh, is counterproductive to the type of trading. We're just trying to, you know, be active investors, take it from a step from just manually, uh, you know, buying mutual funds or anything, but we don't need to do risk, high risk trades where we all of a sudden have to start working, worrying about the whether we're winning or losing, right? We don't want to get into the, at least I don't want to trade where, you know, you have to, you, you know, you're going to get a certain amount of losses and you know, you're going to get a certain amount of wins and you have to make sure that your wins are more than your losses and all of that stuff. I just like winning. Yeah. Winners. We're both winners over here, AJ. Uh, we just had a question come in from Luther. I'm going to go ahead and broadcast it and read it out. Um, okay. When you have four or five candidates, you'll have chosen for your premium selling strategy. What criteria do you use to zero in on the best candidates? Do you look at the ones with the highest IV? Uh, that that could be one thing. You know, that's that's a great question. I'll tell you what I wind up doing uh, because there's a lot of criteria. There's implied volatility is a great thing because when you sell premium, uh, it can be boosted up by high IV. So that's one criteria. But I almost like to change the thought process. And it's not about selling the premium, right? It's about buying the protection whenever the underlying symbol goes against the initial trade. So whatever the covering trade is, when you have a covering trade, you're either going to be going long the stock or you're going to be going short the stock, or you're going to be using some sort of option substitute for going long the stock or short the stock. And if you're going long the stock, then you're going to be selling calls. And you know that's the that's the the covering for selling calls. If you go short the stock, you're going to be selling puts. So great. Um, when you sell premium, you basically put yourself under an obligation that if that underlying symbol at the end of the the expiration date is out of range or in the money, that buyer is going to exercise you. So that's kind of a weird obligation to put yourself under. And you know, there's a lot of methodologies that say. Uh, that's what you want to do. You want to collect premium. It turns out if we are buying protection on our option, let's change the thought process. And let's say the reason why we sell premium is to offset the cost of protection. And that protection is an out of the money directional play, right? And so, and the strike price of that option is where the option goes in the money, and that's where it actually becomes protection. It becomes a risk hedge. But in the meantime, we're actually going to be trading this thing directionally out of the money. And so what's neat about that is when you trade that option directionally out of the money, um, every time the underlying symbol moves your way, the gains accrue exponentially. And when the underlying symbol goes against you, the gains actually reduce exponentially. So you get better gains in the direction that you want it to go and poorer gains or poorer losses. So that's a good that's a good dynamic when you have that kind of premium parabola that you're you're trading on. And so we can actually be profiting by rolling these protective options out every month and profit even more by offsetting their cost by selling premium. So. All to say, IV isn't it, uh, isn't the only thing I would look at. I would look at ease of timing my signals. Uh, so what does that mean? That means I don't want to have to use some mysterious timing methodology that perhaps can create a whole bunch of false positives and get me into investments that turn on me before I know about it. So through back testing each of those candidates in your watch list, I would determine what would be the best or what has been the best timing in order to get into that trade uh, and, and manage the trade as it goes along. Identify those points where we sell premium by protection and then those points where we roll the protection out, rinse and repeat. So I would, through back testing on each of those candidates, determine how you're going to do it. And then what I would do is actually I would paper trade all five of those. I know this is going to sound like I want a quick, easy way to look up 
the uh, you know IV or Delta or something and know exactly which one. Turns out, I'd like to paper trade all five and put them into a little competition of real time trading, real time paper trading, and find out over the period of say thirty to forty five days which of those five candidates is the easiest trade that gives you the most reward, right? And that one's going to filter up to the top because in real time paper trading, you'll find out that some of those candidates that look so good on paper had such good pedigree resumes and all of that good stuff. Man, those ones become like the most maintenance requiring positions. You know, they're just the highest maintenance positions to keep going. And like you miss your, 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 uh, entries, the entries come fast and go, or they're false entries and you have to do all these adjustments to get out of it. Whereas there's these other ones that may have not looked so good on paper that in real time forward trading come to the top as being like super easy to trade. You can't miss the signal and they just pay bountiful rewards. After 30 to 45 days of doing like a head-to-head -head test on these five candidates, you'll know exactly which one to trade. Yeah, so thank you for that, Luther. Appreciate the live audience questions. Absolutely. Um, and I think our next question is is very unique from a very unique individual. Um, here at, at Trading Trainer, we're always encouraging people to learn the art of options trading and on the surface it can look super complicated and a little bit scary, but I think there's hope when we see the the younger generations finding interest. And I believe our next question comes from a very young candidate by the name of Manny in Akron, who, how old was he, AJ? It looks like Manny's 10 years old. 10 years old and already- That's awesome trading options, learning the art. And he actually has a very good question, I believe. Yeah, it looks like Manny's asking us, why does everyone say options are risky? So I, first of all, shout out to you, Manny, for being interested in this topic. A lot of kids, a lot of, a lot of folks, I'm not going to say kids, a lot of people your age are not, you know, even tuned. A lot of people my age aren't even tuned into these things. So uh, I think you're off to an amazing start. So why are options considered risky? Why do people talk about them being risky? I think that a lot of people have gotten burned, Manny, because options can really create something called leverage, right? Um, take, for example, uh, this, uh, let's pull up a symbol like Ford. So Ford is trading at now let's let's take a, an example of something that's even more expensive. Let's take something like um, a GE General Electric. So General Electric is trading around $90, $92.10 as we speak. And so a lot of folks would say, "Okay, I could buy some shares of GE at $92 and if it went up uh $10, then I'd make something like a little over 10%. Great. And so then they get excited because then they learn about options. So let's take a look at the options, Manny. Um, if I was to get an option, say an option that expires in June, and I want an option that acts like the stock, so I'd go pretty deep in the money, uh, probably find something like maybe... Uh, I think maybe this option right here, this option, the $70 call. So the $70 call, Manny, is only $20, $22. It's about $22. So $90 for the stock or $22 for the option. And what's neat about this $22 option is that when the underlying stock goes up $1, so will the option. So I can spend $92, and if I get a gain of $10, I'd make 10%. Or I could spend $22, and I'd get a gain of $10, and that would be like a 33% ROI. So that's called leverage, and that's really fantastic because people who know how to use leverage, they can take a, a, an ordinary move in a stock and multiply it by using an option. But where people forget 
is that the same thing works with losses. And so, for instance, say um, somebody can afford 100 shares of that stock. And they say, okay, I'm going to spend $9,000. These stocks cost $90 a share. I'm going to spend $9,000. And um, if that you know, stock pulls a- away from me, I might lose 500 bucks. And I'm fully prepared to lose that 500 bucks. The problem is, is when people start using this option leverage, they say, well, I have that $9,000. So Because these things cost $22 instead of $90, in our case, let's just assume it's $20, I could buy a whole bunch more than just $100. I could buy 400, 450 shares instead of the 100 shares of the stock. And think about it. I could make so much more money because... When that goes up and I make 33% on my money, I'll make it on 450 shares instead of just 100 shares. Problem is, is sometimes the stocks don't go your way. So now the person who bought 450 shares when the stock goes against them and the option really goes against them, they wind up not just losing a little bit. In one trade, they could lose a good portion of their portfolio, like half. So it's the understanding around leverage and the understanding around risk, right? It's so easy to get so enticed by the possibilities of the reward and you get turned on to options and you you say to yourself, oh my gosh, I can get the same, you know, or more reward with a smaller amount of investment, but there's also a downside and a lot of folks don't pay attention to the downside. And so when the stock goes against them and the option goes against them, they get wiped out because they just haven't been paying attention to risk. So one thing to think about Manny, when you are uh, starting to do your own options trading is when you pick an option, that's going to be substituting for a stock and you're going to use that leverage Make sure you analyze what your maximum loss can be and keep it within a range. You might wind up having to trade less of your portfolio than you thought, but it keeps that risk in check. It keeps that maximum amount of loss in check. And a lot of grownups, I have to tell you, don't do this. They don't even understand this concept. They just get wowed by the dollar signs and they don't analyze risk. And if you want to be a long-term trader, one thing I've learned being a trader for as long as I am have um, is that that's one thing that successful traders who have been successful traders for a long time do. They analyze their risk and don't pay so much attention to the, the reward that's possible. They don't count the reward until they've already made it and it's in their bank account and then they count their money. They don't count money they haven't had yet. Yeah, I feel like the big lesson from that question is is understanding leverage, right? It's it's very unique concept. There's a lot of ways to approach it. Um, And if you utilize some of the strategies from your program, you teach people how to use utilize leverage in the riskless, the most risk free way using these tools. Absolutely. In fact, in our programs, you know, the max amount of risk that we ever open our portfolio to is like a 4% drop. And that means you'd have to do 25 really poor trades in a row to wipe yourself out. Um, You know, it's funny because I even had one of my most experienced traders forget these concepts just because you can get so wowed by the dollar figures. He's like, you know, I missed this trade. I could have traded a hundred call, uh, you know, a couple of contracts of call options, and I would have been up a hundred thousand dollars. I said, "Did you analyze the risk? You could have also been down three hundred thousand dollars. You really want to be in that position." Wow, you know, sometimes we think about only the gains and not the losses. Yeah, it definitely um, is a consistent, like it's a game of consistency, and you've been very consistent for what 18 18 plus years now is that what we're going on 
Well, 19 years since I started trading trainer and I've been trading since 1997. So we're just over 25 years that I've been an active trader. 25 years, a lot of technology changes, a lot of tools have been innovated. So, you know, your perspective, I feel, is a very high quality perspective on the market because you have seen all these things and you figured out these strategies that seem to work, you know, month over month, no matter things go up, down, sideways. It's just part of the game. Hey, man, the key is be chill. You're the chillest guy I know. Thank you. Um, so speaking of that, uh, heading into the weekend, are you going to be doing any anything chill in that respect? We're celebrating birthdays. That's that's pretty much it. We're celebrating birthdays. Other than that, I hope it's a, a mellow weekend. I've had a couple of busy weekends. I think we've got uh, some shows to see around here. The Everything's opening up. The theaters are opening up. So I think we've got a, a show to see on Sunday evening and maybe some friends to see. How about you? What are you doing this weekend? Oh, well, um, we're going to be giving a, a run at stand-up comedy on Sunday night. What? So, uh I got a couple of Will Smith jokes, right? A couple of Jay of Pinkett course. Smith jokes. <laughs> <laughs> Watch out for Jay. You'll have somebody come up I, on the stage. I feel like I'm all right, though. Like, I, I'm a fighter at heart. So if anybody wants to go at it, hey, I hope someone's just recording it. Cause, so if uh, somebody's in the Los Angeles area, you should go check right. out SIP. Is it Saturday night? It's Sunday night in uh, in Santa Monica, kind of where we, we shot all our little side clips. Clips, yeah. All um, right. Also, I also I might check out some of those shows you recommended. Um, it's just it's weird with all these new like startup shows coming out, right? We've got the Uber, we got WeWork, we've we got work. Theranos. Oh gosh, Theranos. There's uh, also the, that one about that uh, person who never really was uh, a, a she she was a fraud from the beginning, uh, inventing Anna. Yeah, I actually finished that one. That was very interesting. A lot of good content out these days. A lot of good content if you're interested in, you know, following in the footsteps and not creating the same mistakes, but maybe making your own mistakes. Yeah. Um, all right. Cool, AJ. Um, appreciate everybody tuning in. If you enjoyed the content, feel free to hit that subscribe, smash that like button, uh, drop any comments, questions you have in the uh, comment sections dm us we'll get back to you as soon as we can otherwise with that aj i hope uh i wish your wife a, a happy birthday and i hope you guys have a, a wonderful weekend we'll catch everybody next week all right break a leg man all right see you guys later thank you for tuning into the aj brown show if you're interested in learning more about AJ and his investing techniques, head on over to tradingtrainer.com and create your free account today. And if you're not already a subscriber to the show, hit that subscribe button and we'll get you fresh content daily.